I had exactly zero expectations when it came to Monarch on the Nintendo Switch. It was developed by Furyu Corporation and published by NIS America. But then I realized that a few of the development team also worked on Shimagami Tensei and I was a little more excited. And it's yet another RPG set inside a school where a mystical other world is causing issues. Is this one the Monarch of JRPGs or another lowly eShop peasant? Well, let's find out. This is madness. Narratively speaking, Monarch isn't dissimilar to a hundred games before it. You get to name your protagonist, but he's lost his memory, and after a series of lucid dreams set in another dimension, he wakes up in a school to find some concerned people. Most importantly, his sister, whom he can't remember, what amounts to the president of the students' union and the school doctor. There's a lockdown in the school caused by a mysterious force, which stops anyone from leaving. Certain floors are invaded by a mist, which has caused a madness from those trapped within. In. The only way to dissipate the mist and return the school to normal is to defeat the Pact Bearers. These powerful individuals have the power to command their egos, with ego within this game being a form of power, allowing them to dominate those around them and impose their will. Once defeated, the mist clears and that area of the school is returned to normal. There are an interesting cast of side characters, all of whom are voice acted, but some of the exposition is a touch nonsensical. Vanity is an aberration. It isn't one of the deadly sins. And the game's use of the words ego, authority, pact bearers will initially leave you scratching your head as to what on earth is going on, as their meanings have certainly been adapted. You'll find a number of JRPG tropes, with the pompous, overpowered antagonists who like the sound of their own voice, to the bad boy ladies man who's a bit of an arrogant twit. You can't spell pacifist without fist. But stereotypes and tropes tend to come from those things being quite enjoyable to actually play with, and that's certainly the case here. At times it can feel like a box ticking exercise as a new character pops up to fill a certain role, but I felt like the dialogue was good enough to carry it across. Gameplay is segmented into two distinctive areas. Exploration allowing you to move around the school, fast travel between previously visited locations, and interact with pieces of information or clues. Before you begin you get to name your character, and you'll undergo an ego test. This is essentially a personality test with a series of questions which will shape your character's build based on seven distinctive areas. They reflect the seven deadly sins, and you can also increase these areas through dialogues with other characters in the game, giving you access to what's known as alter egos. We'll try and keep it as simple as possible here though, and focus on the real core aspects. The mobile phone is the heart of the menu system, and it's from here that you'll be customizing your character, accessing the map screen, or your current objectives, and every piece of information that you gather or learn will be held here. One nice aspect are the few puzzles, where you'll need to rely on information gathered from pupils around the school, with every pupil you speak to having their profile unlocked for you to access, such as a password being needed, but you find out it's the last four digits of their ID. So the aim of the game then, to enter the foggy areas and to eventually defeat the Pact Bearers. But once you're in these, you'll notice a madness gauge in the bottom corner of the screen. What does this do exactly? Well, it gradually makes you go crazy. If you reach 100, after a while you're going to black out, waking up in the infirmary. But it also affects the other pupils in the area sending them crazy. And here's where things get a little more interesting and equally strange. Occasionally within these areas you'll receive death calls. If you answer the phone during this time, you'll be transported into a battle with enemies far above your own level and it's essentially a death sentence. If you ignore your phone though, any pupils caught within the madness area of the fog will begin to move towards you and one touch from them and, well, you will join them in their delirium and wake up in the infirmary. This is only a minor part of the game and it's not where the main combat comes from. That's where your slightly unusual companion Vanitas comes in. This demonic bunny rabbit bridges the gap between the two worlds and allows you to make phone calls when within its proximity, essentially giving you the option to choose your fights. This all might sound confusing, but basically, when you need to grind, you go to the floating bunny rabbit, make a phone call, and you're teleported into the other realm to fight. And this is where combat begins. After having chosen which characters are going to take part, you're shown a list of criteria as well as a turn count to achieve the highest possible score. You're shown a movement sphere and can travel freely within it. You can manually select which character you want using the bumper buttons, and once your turn's over, it will simply move on to the next available character until all turns in your party have been used. Sounds really, really standard, doesn't it? But where this changes is in the deferral system. You could move to the extent of your range and then defer your turn to another player. This then allows them to have a second go. They can move and attack once more, but it will raise their madness 
Madness gauge. Within combat, Madness acts almost like a fury, but inevitably it will have the same outcome. If you reach 100 and you're mad for a set period, that character will eventually pass out. The Madness gauge is also increasing every time you use your demonic authority powers shown down here. It's a balancing act between keeping that lower, but also being able to defeat the enemies using some of your skills. But it's that deferral mechanic that makes it special, and it allows for some real strategy. Now, when your players are close to the enemy, as we've seen in many tactical turn-based games, you can rely on them to follow up your attacks, as long as they're within range. Combat can initially feel far too difficult, and I think much of that is caused by confusion. Leveling up doesn't happen in the traditional sense. When you win a battle, you're not given equal distribution of XP between your characters, but what you are given is a currency that you can later apply and choose exactly who you want to level up and in what way. And if you don't like the way that you've chosen, you can undo this at any point. It turns out to be a really nice system. And on balance, I prefer being able to choose to go and fight to grind rather than having random battles or having combat forced upon me. This isn't going to be the case for everyone, but be aware an intrinsic part of the experience is seeking out combat through that phone call system to make sure you're a high enough level some of those trickier fights. Even with that system in place, it does feel like the balancing of difficulty is skewed out of the player's favor, especially in the earlier stages. It's particularly annoying in combat when your main player dies and it's game over and you have to head back to the infirmary. Simply having them knocked unconscious with the ability for other players to resurrect them or revive them would have made more sense, as sometimes you'll just get unlucky and find yourself combat locked and dead before you can even do a thing about it. Aside from party members that you'll meet in the real world, you'll also gain a few others. These can be customized by yourself and renamed, and they have access to unique equipable items which are gained through combat. They're an unusual but nice touch, and I wouldn't be without Glenn and Bob, two more wonderful individuals never have I met. Once you've got to grips with the flow of Monarch, it's a very enjoyable JRPG, but does falter a little when it comes to grinding. It's easy enough to control, everything's sensibly placed, but there are a few times where camera control is a bit of an issue, but we'll discuss that in the visual section, and grouping everything you'll need within that phone is a smart choice. A smartphone choice in a way. Ouch. Unfortunately though, towards the mid to latter part of the game, it feels like it never got to a full sprint. It starts out really enjoyable with the promise of bigger things to come, and a lot of that doesn't materialize. Almost like this developer are struggling to push games to that next stage. And while it's good, for me it stopped Monarch being a great game. Gameplay scores 15 out of 20, and the control score 15 out of 20. The Shin Mikado Academy is an aesthetically quite bland place. It's gloomy and, dare I say it, a little lifeless, but the foggy sections do carry a certain atmosphere to them with a horror quality that's difficult to put my finger on. I think it stems from the audio, whether it be the banging or screaming of someone in the distance or the unusual macabre sounds produced by those suffering from the madness. jump over to the combat then and the other world and there's a real juxtaposition in terms of design and colour. Although the enemies look like they've escaped from the set of Dead Space, there are some really well designed boss encounters and these unusual mannequin style foes certainly fit the aesthetic of the game. Character designs are okay but overall the aesthetic to me just looks dated and it's yet another game where the main protagonist is silent but still has a flapping mouth animation leaving him looking more like a fish out of water. I mentioned the camera control and when you're within certain areas you can freely move this, looking up, down, left and right. However, when you leave the building or enter larger spaces, the camera's locked to an overhead position, but you'll feel almost like you're constrained. You'll be trying to move and look around, but you can't to the point where it feels unusual. Music and audio are of a very high quality. can choose between the English or Japanese translations, and although there's always snobbery around the English dub, it's not too bad here in my opinion. I thought the soundtrack was excellent though, and it did a lot to heighten the atmosphere. In handheld, everything's just fine. Frame rates are 30 FPS, whether docked or in handheld, with minimal slowdown. Text size is not a problem, and you have a few other options to invert axis and increase sensitivities, but that's about it. As far as visuals and performance go, I give the game 15 out of 20. It performs just fine, but those visuals are tad uninspired. Audio scores 18 out of 20, with a solid soundtrack and good audio design. 
Monarch is an expensive game, there's no two ways about it. Although I have found the physical edition for £39 and that's the deluxe edition over on Amazon here in the UK. So it looks that you'll be able to buy it for cheaper if you're buying physically. It carries a 6.8 gigabyte download. It's not perfect and if you're opposed to grinding then this won't be the game for you. There are elements that I've really enjoyed but more than a few where it doesn't live up to the potential that it could have. For me this would be a sales pickup but it is a very long game offering about 50 to 100 hours of gameplay but by the end it feels like quantity over quality i give value 15 out of 20. No, you're null and void there's no doubt in my mind that Monarch is a good game. I thought a few of the combat mechanics were really inspired. It's yet another JRPG that doesn't quite resolve the need to grind, and also one that's longer than it needs to be. Still enjoyable, just not quite top tier. It gets a switch up score of 78%. Let me know in the comments if this is a game you've been interested in or are considering picking up, and if I've forgotten anything or you need any other information, please do leave a question down below. As always, a big thanks to all of you who watch, and to our patrons, you guys support us each and every month. If you're buying physically with Play Asia, you can save a bit of money using our codes down in the description. And if you're buying digitally, you can save a bit of money using 10% off on our website with code SWITCHUP. Thanks so much, and for all things Switch, all the time, keep it SWITCHUP. Cheers, guys. See ya! Bye.